Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Dharma Junkie Podcast. And this one's kind of a special one for me because on this episode, I have the guiding teachers of Wild Heart Meditation Center in Nashville, Tennessee, Andrew Chapman and Mikey Noshel. And they've been my teachers for the past few years and have been absolutely instrumental in developing my practice into what it is today and really just guiding my my life. Like My life has taken a completely different direction since really fully delving into this practice. So I can't thank them enough for doing this episode and talking to me. And we talk about a lot of stuff. We talk about meditation and we talk about just uh, how they got to where they're at and a little bit of background about Wild Heart, what it is that they do there and some of the offerings that they have coming up. One of which is a residential retreat at the William J. Kelly Retreat Center in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, coming up on September 1st through the 5th. So we haven't been able to sit residential retreats for the past few years because of COVID and things are starting to open back up. So if you're interested in sitting a life-changing residential retreat, we've got one for you. So anyway, without further ado, Andrew Chapman and Mikey Noshel. You might catch yourself sliding in and out of you might catch yourself sliding in and out of a loop. Do, just relax and enjoy it. just relax and enjoy it. This is an experiment, is an experiment in, mind in mind formation. In formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, and your mind and your brain. We're using digital We're using techniques, digital techniques to, overload, to overload, scramble, scramble, confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind, your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, Chaos is beautiful. Mikey Nochelle and Andrew Chapman. It is an absolute pleasure to have you guys on the podcast, man. This is a, an episode that's going to be kind of near and dear to my heart because you guys are both so near and dear to my heart. Mikey and Andrew are my teachers, and uh, they have been guiding me for the past uh, two and a half years, I'd say, some, somewhere around there. And uh, it's a, it's an absolute pleasure to have you guys here. What's up? What's up, Justin? What's Thanks for up? having us, man. Yeah. yeah, peace and love. Peace and love. Love you, brother. Yeah, love you too, man. Love you guys. So what do you guys got going on, man? Uh, you want to tell us uh, just a little bit about yourselves and uh, what it is that you do and kind of how you arrived at what you do? Yeah, for sure. Um, what's up, everyone? My name is Andrew Chapman. I'm currently the guiding teacher at Wild Heart Meditation Center. We're a nonprofit Buddhist meditation center in Nashville, Tennessee, and we've been around for about 14 years or so. Um, and outside of the meditation center, I'm a therapist and I've worked in addictions treatment, do a lot of trauma work with people. And I run a therapy practice in Nashville called Experience Therapy Group. Nice, nice. And uh, how, about, how about you, Mikey? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a teacher with Wild Heart Meditation Center out here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I do one-on-one -on -one pastoral counseling, do a lot of uh, groups within treatment centers, and also uh, do, a, do me, Andrew and I have been working a lot now and bringing residential retreats into the world as the world opens up from COVID. It seems like it's a wonderful demand that we have these days as people want to go on these residential retreats. So uh, that's what we've been working on lately. Right. And you've actually got one coming up, don't you? Yes, we do. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, we have one coming up September 1st through the 5th, which is Labor Day weekend. It's at uh, William J. Kelly Retreat Center. This is in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. And shout out to Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. I am like super stoked that we have uh, these residential Buddhist meditation retreats popping off in the South, because I know Andrew and I, uh, towards the beginning of our practice, we would have to fly out to like LA and then drive out to like Joshua Tree, California and go on retreats there. So it's nice to see the Dharma growing in the South. And it's wonderful that we are able to bring our own flavor to the Dharma. So Flowering Lotus Meditation is hosting it. And uh, yeah, so five days silent retreat. Um, 
It's, it's going to be rad. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be good for anyone that's either brand new to it. I know it can be intimidating. I know I was for my first retreat. Like, what do you mean? I'm going to sit in silence for five days, <laughs> you know, have to deal with my mind, but it's silent, but it's supported. So you're sitting with other people, you're getting teachings and instructions. You have group interviews. Um, you know, we kind of pride ourselves on having a pretty accessible retreat for anyone, whether you're brand new or you've been sitting retreat for a while. And also for folks that are interested, you know, if you are going to travel to the retreat, you can fly into New Orleans. It's like an hour or two drive and they're trying to coordinate ride sharing and things like that. Also, if you live in the Southeast and you want to drive, you can do that too. You can stay with Justin on your way up. <laughs> yeah, I'll just sleep on the floor. I just have 50 people in your house. So <laughs> Justin, you've been on retreat with us before. Uh, what do you think? What, what, what should people expect out of retreat with us? Have no expectations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for have real. No uh, I, I really appreciate the container of the retreat. It's just such a supportive container, you know, that I think that was the biggest thing for me. It was like, and uh, I'll go ahead and tell everybody, prepare to be a little frustrated at first. I think that's <laughs> going to be natural. I think I, I, across the board, I think everybody that I've talked to has resonated that at least with their first few retreats. So like, I, I just wanted to leave. I mean, like the first couple of days, I just wanted to leave. And then mm-hmm. there's a, this point, at least for me, where I hit this I don't even know what to call it, but uh, maybe a, a, a moment of awakening. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it was just like, okay, okay. And then I kind of just eased into it. It was, it was good. It was good. I really enjoyed the, uh, the Memorial Day retreat we did. That was good. So, yeah, the name of the retreat coming up is Peace Within the Wild Heart. And Ooh. it's kind of what you're describing. Like, normally when we think of peace, it's like the absence of any sort of discomfort or frustration but in this Buddhist path, we turn towards any sort of frustration and difficulty and pain, and we find peace within that difficulty. And that's the theme of this retreat. Let's, let's unearth this wild heart and find peace with the heart as it is, not trying to constrain the heart to make it a positive heart or a happy heart. Let's love the heart as it is. And then we find this higher happiness of the peacefulness that comes from you know, sitting down in this frustration. So I'm, I appreciate your honesty about the realness of retreat. And let's be honest about the fruit of this. The fruit is peace within. And even as we are frustrated, even as we are gleeful, happily, happy and blissful, let's find peace with that heart and let it be wild. So uh, peace and love to that. Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's an excellent description. And uh, yeah, uh, good theme, good theme for the retreat, because that's exactly what I experienced for sure, 100%. So how long have you guys have been practicing for quite a while, right? So uh, like individually, like Andrew, like how long have you been involved with Buddhist practice and how did you get involved with that in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how long, probably like 11 or 12 years now at this point. And I got involved through knowing people in recovery that were a part of against the stream. And so Dave Smith was my first teacher and he had a sitting group in Nashville. And I knew Dave actually from recovery, but also from the music scene in Nashville. And I just thought, Hey, here's a guy that looks like me and sounds like me and talks like me with a similar background. And he's into Buddhism and Buddhist meditation, something I'd always been interested in. So I gave it a shot and um, it just instantly resonated with me. Uh, The kind of feature of the Buddhist teachings, which is more of an invitation for self exploration rather than a belief system, kind of the, the invitation to investigate your own heart and mind really resonated with me and, and felt like a easy pathway into it and pretty much hit the ground running. Started going to the meditation group every week. I uh, sat a retreat within the first year and took off from there. Nice, nice, awesome. How about you, Mikey? Um, yeah, it, it's always like the the question: How did you get into Buddhism? Yeah. And generally, the <laughs> same answer is the same, right? Like, you, you know, what's the answer? Suffering, suffering, a great deal of suffering, um, and a great deal of of willingness and faith and 
I feel very grateful I stumbled on this Buddhist path because I started, oh God, I, I don't even know, maybe 13 years ago. And uh, you stayed in, in my office before that I have my precepts, my first official precepts uh, into the Buddhist path, right? When you can officially call yourself a Buddhist was in 2012. I took the five precepts in the Soto Zen tradition under Claude Anshin Thomas, a mutual friend of ours. And uh, from, from there on out, it's been a wild ride that uh, I think it's like fortunate in the United States that we have a very integrated Dharma that we can uh, pick and choose from different paths to to what practices are helpful for us. And so starting in Zen was extremely helpful for me because I was like a fuck up kid that didn't like structure, didn't like authority, didn't, didn't like uh, instruction. And when I started my Buddhist path, it was with Claude Anshin Thomas, who is a Vietnam veteran and a Soto Zen priest. And if you know anything about those two worlds, they are extremely structured. They're extremely diligent. And I'm, you know, a punk rocker kid coming in with a floppy blue mohawk with a dreadlock rat tail down my ass and and smelling like shit. And I wasn't sober at the time. I smelled like fucking, you know, beer from the night before. And I'd wake up to go to the meditation hall. And then this guy kind of just um, gave it to me and, <laughs> you know, showed me with the gentle assertiveness all the ways I'm I'm creating a mess in my own life. And then showed me the way to make my way out of this mess. And then it was, I think, uh, maybe about 2016, I think, I, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee. And I started on the same path that Andrew is on with the Against the Stream song, uh, now Wild Heart song uh, under Dave Smith. And and now we've blossomed this community in the in the earlier forms of Buddhism, the Theravada, the Insight tradition, the Pasna tradition. So, uh, yeah. Do you, uh, could you unpack the difference between, say, uh, Mahayana and Theravada for people? Yeah, totally. So, the which one first? <laughs> Your choice. Yeah. So the, let's start with the beginning. The earliest forms of Buddhism, uh, generally, this is a general, generally speaking, would be the Theravada. And the Theravada path is uh, what we would call the lesser vehicle. It is based off of the teachings that were alive in the time of the Buddha. It's strictly based off of this is what Siddhartha Gautama taught 2,600 years ago. And the collection of his teachings come from what we call the Pali Canon. And the Pali Canon is an oral tradition that was like passed down for uh, hundreds of years until they collected it into a collection of books. And this collection of books is uh, like something like 10 Bibles worth of, of books. And then further on, there was a break within the Theravada that uh, expounded upon it into the Mahayana. And, you know, I say, oh, the Theravada has like 10 Bibles worth of discourses that they follow. Some reason the Mahayana felt like there should be more. So the Mahayana also recognizes even more teachings that went beyond even just Siddhartha Gautama, the original Buddha, but they uh, added even more texts and stuff like that. So something like Soto Zen that I'm talking about, which is under the umbrella of Mahayana, the greater vehicle, where they have more teachings. Uh, it's, predominantly from the teachings of Dogen Zenji. Um, and so they'll, they'll study a lot. If you go to a Zen group, you'll probably hear less about oh, what the Buddha taught. You'll hear more about what Dogen taught. And that's still in line with the Buddhist teachings. It's just what teacher you're listening to. And so to simplify that, Theravada is uh, more just what the Buddha taught. And then Mahayana is what the Buddha taught and expounding upon other teachers, other Buddhas, other uh, bodhisattvas. Right on, right on. That's an excellent answer. Thank you, thank you. Um, Andrew, I had, I had some questions. You, you've gone and sat in Thailand, correct? Uh, actually, I've sat in uh, Myanmar. Myanmar, uh, okay. Yeah, I haven't sat any retreats in Thailand. Okay, so what was my, uh, could, you, could you tell me about that experience? Yeah, for sure. Um, I went to, I call it the Disneyland of Dharma, the uh, Upanditas Monastery called Pandita Rama, which is a super fun name. 
Um, and it's a forest monastery that's been established for probably decades at this point. And uh, they specifically practice the insight tradition that was developed mostly by Maha- Ma- Mahasi Sayadaw. So it's a noting technique. And it's like Mikey was saying about the Zen tradition, very rigorous, very disciplined. You wake up at three in the morning, you go to bed at nine at night. And you're doing something like 14 to 16 formal hours of meditation a day. Um, And yeah, I mean, the reason why I wanted to go there was to see what practicing the Buddha's Dharma was like in a culture that hasn't been divorced from it pretty much since the time, you know, shortly after his passing, right? Because he was in uh, Northern India, which is modern day Nepal. And then shortly after his passing, it spread into Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka. And so I wanted to practice in a tradition that was kind of rooted in that history. And it is a different vibe, right? Like, like Mikey was saying about us as Americans learning about Buddhism, you come at it through like a stress reduction approach, right? You come at usually through the vehicle of meditation. I want to learn how to meditate. And that's the core thing that the Buddha taught. But in Southeast Asia, you come at it in a holistic way. You know, you really come at it from this perspective that awakening is attainable Mm -hmm. and that if you apply not just the meditative practices, but the ethical precepts, you know, and the intention of Donna of practicing generosity um, in all of your activities, that these things work together to, to actually help you to wake up completely and entirely and out of the cycle of suffering that we're born into. So that's pretty gnarly. You know, that's nothing I never want, you know, it's not anything I ever wanted from Buddhism when I first came into it. Um, I wanted some freedom from my personal suffering, Uh, but when you learn about it in a tradition that has that level of faith behind it, it really changes the way that you practice do you think that uh, Nibbana is a factor that kind of gets left out a lot, just that, that it is attainable? You know, just like you're saying that, that in the West, we kind of like gloss over that, that, you know, in the, in the original teachings, it's like, okay, this is a thing that is here. <laughs> it's here all the time. It's not, not anything to attain, but it is here. It's always present. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's for that reason. I think there are a couple of reasons why one is that we have, a largely Judeo-Christian view. So the idea that you can, uh, through one's own practice, cultivate the heart and mind to realize the nature of our experience in a way that true peace, perfect peace, if you would, uh, is attainable, is, um, you know, very antithetical to what we're often taught, which is that we're kind of serving, uh, you know, through God's grace, serving this, you know, system of belief and that you get born into this eternal heaven. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Buddhism kind of flips out on its head and says, you know, heaven is here and now all the time. And you can attain it through, you know, cultivating the heart and the mind. And the other reason why is because in the West, we're so attainment focused in the sense of self improvement Mm -hmm. that we oftentimes, when we teach about uh, Nibbana, Nirvana, it's a tricky thing because we think about it something that you have to get. Right. But it's actually more of just a doorway that we walk through. And what it really means is a cooling down of reactivity. So every moment we have a choice to walk through the door of being non reactive you know, with, with an open heart. And so in that sense, enlightenment is not, you know, necessarily a thing you go after and get. Um, I think you could make the argument that it is, and I get that, (laughs) but I think it's, uh, it's available here and now always. And the realization of that in its perfection to actually attain Nibbana would be having repetitively walked through that door so many times that the door stays open. Right. And so, um, could you imagine a space where there's no reactivity? You know, there's still pain. There's still birth, aging, sickness, death, as long as we're in this body, you know, but there's not suffering around the impermanence and the pain that we experience. And I think it's definitely, I mean, it's been my experience that over time, 
uh, less and less reactivity is present in this heart and this mind. And so I have hope, you know, of at least keeping going. I don't know if I'm ever going to get enlightened, <laughs> but uh, right. I can suffer less. And that's a good goal. Right. Yeah. What is it like 10%? If I could suffer 10% less than I'm in there. Yeah. That's a good goal. Yeah. But wasn't it a Buddha Dasa that said that if Nibbana wasn't always present, that we'd just go insane. Like <laughs> if we weren't able to tap into it, like all the time that we just absolutely just lose our shit. When, when that, I think that was Buddha Dasa in, uh, in, uh, enlightenment for everyone. I'm not so sure. Nibbana, Nibbana, it sounds it sounds like something he would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was Nibbana for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to rewind a little bit and talk about the uh, Andrew going over to Myanmar, uh, the Mahasi tradition. And when you're asking me about the Mahayana tradition versus the Theravada tradition, let's be clear: the Mahasi tradition is Theravada. It is the earliest forms of, of Buddhism. And I think it's really cool that, you know, Andrew went there to see the, you know, the, the Disneyland of this. And this is kind of, you know, there's a little bit of integration of other paths, but this is really the tradition we're teaching in. And so if you come to our retreat, you're going to get very similar uh, teachings that you would get from this tradition out in Myanmar. And um, which is this earliest form of of teaching the Theravada teachings too? So. I, yeah, I would say. I mean, that's a piece of it. Anyone that gets trained in the insight tradition in the U.S., you're likely to be influenced heavily by IMS and Spirit Rock, right? IMS is in Barrie, Massachusetts. Spirit Rock's in Woodacre, California. Um, you know, Sharon Salzberg, Jack Cornfield, Joseph Goldstein, okay. right? And uh, it is an infusion of the Burmese tradition, which is what we're referring to as Myanmar, the Mahasi Sayadaw method, which is this noting technique, um, and the Thai forest tradition, yeah. you know, which isn't so heavily technique oriented, but it is a combination of developing tranquility through present awareness um, and insight through present awareness. And I would say, if anything, we take after probably a little bit more the Thai forest tradition, but it's infused with both of these lineages. And both the Thai forest and uh, Burmese tradition are of the Theravada, you know, of that lineage. Who are some of the uh, Thai forest teachers that you kind of lean towards? Well, Buddha Dasa, yeah, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, he's, you know, in the Thai tradition and you know, the, well, who would you say? Well, I've sat month retreat with uh, Ajahn Sachito mm -hmm. and he was trained by Ajahn Chah. And so I would say that a lot of what makes sense to my heart and my mind when practicing the Buddhist teachings are this lineage of practice that comes from Ajahn Chah. Um, and yeah, Ajahn Sachito is, I think, a teacher that I look to a lot and, um, has helped me significantly in my practice. And also, you know, very interestingly, there's this teacher named Saida Utejania, who I believe is Burmese, um, but has a very Thai forest and almost even a Zen like approach to the practice. And so there's a lot of variations. I would say that my practice is very esoteric in that way. You know, over time, <laughs> this is what's cool about teaching retreat and going on retreat actually is that you get an opportunity to sit with, you know, you hear that phrase that there are many paths, um, but one awakening right. and you get to practice all these different paths. And I don't think any are better than the other, you know, and we kind of merge paths in our tradition too, but that's one of the cool things about going on retreat is you just get a lot of different perspectives really on the same journey. So I do want to interject because uh, I want the tone of our teachings to really come out too. that uh, we're talking about the tradition. And I think, uh, you know, well, something in me, my heart like lights, lights up, right. That we can pass this down, like look at the lineages of all the different people that have passed this down, that we are able to sit in meditation today that goes all the way back to the Buddha. Right. And at the same time, we bring our own flavor in and, um, 
is it is it fair to welcome in a Dharma death match? This is something that Andrew and I play quite often. Uh, we'll be on retreat. We'll be teaching a treat, retreat. Andrew did this to me. We were walking at Hartwood Refuge and they have that, that big lake and it's like a mile around. And Andrew and I were like walking around this lake one day and we were planning on what to teach on the retreat that night. And then he said, oh, you know, who would win in a fight? And I think it was the, the first question was who would win in a fight, Sati Patana or Anapanasati? But I feel like if it's okay with you, we should do a Dharma death match right now. If we're comparing all these traditions, uh, let's play, let's play a game. You want to do that? Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. Cause we want to bring in our own flavor because we like to have fun. Uh, fun in practice is extremely important to me. So, uh, if we're comparing, uh, the Burmese tradition of Mahasi side out and the, uh, the Thai forest tradition of, of Ajahn Shah, who would win in a fight? Is this like completely irreverent? Uh, probably. <laughs> probably. Okay. So Ajahn Shah versus Mahasi Saidao, who would win in a, a Dharma fight? Uh, you guys go. Oh, that's tough. That's tough. I'm in a Dharma fight, like pure Dharma. Yeah. Right. At the okay. sake of being less irreverent, how about we say it this way? <laughs> Who would win the fight in your mind? Which path are you going to take? Are you more of the technical approach of the Burmese, the noting, the kind of simple structure, but very much like every moment you're noting, that's a thought, that's a feeling, that's a sensation. Or are you, you know, the type that needs the spaciousness of not interfering or not <laughs> noting or labeling in your meditation practice, just more of kind of an openness to investigate freely type of mind. Who would win in the fight of, of your mind? What, what, what does your heart and mind need the most? I generally go towards the open spaciousness. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely would lead, I guess, more towards the, the Thai tradition in that sense. Yeah. Okay. We have one on the board for for Ajahn Chah and the Thai forest tradition. Well, I have a, I, I think we're going to sweep the board because a Thai forest would definitely be the way that I lean as well. But I will say, you know, my first meditation teacher, Dave, used to tell me when I started teaching, he said, Andrew, people are coming to the meditation center and you're giving them instructions like notice your breath, be aware of what arises, whether it's a thought or a feeling notice it and then return back to your breath. And he said, the reason we do that is because you have to give the mind something to do. Right. You yeah. know, <laughs> you, if you just tell people like in uh, the Zen tradition, they have this phrase Shinkantaza, which just means just sitting. It means just sitting, no instruction. Don't do anything. Don't try any technique, just sit. And I like that. And especially now, I think this is serves my, my mind, you know, there's nothing to achieve during meditation. Just sit and be aware, you know, but in the beginning, I really needed something to do. And so I would say the the Burmese would win me over in the beginning because they would really give me something to do. They give me a simple technique that I can that's tried and tested over time that will definitely help my awareness, you know, help me pay more attention to my thinking mind throughout the day. But as I stand right now, I would say I'm much more inclined towards less instruction and more of the kind of open, you know, um, invitation of the Thai forest tradition. Last thing I'll say real quick is the Thai forest tradition is also incredibly big on precepts. Mm -hmm. You know, a big part of the Thai forest tradition is really doing the ethical practices and practicing renunciation, you know, really practicing looking at like, what do you really need to live a mindful life? And is more always better, you know, usually not. <laughs> so uh, I think that's always a good balancing factor for the Thai tradition. It's there may not be a lot of techniques in the meditation, but there's definitely a lot to attend to in your daily life. So oh, that, sure. that would win my fight for sure. So I just want to say that the the Mahasi method and tradition um, I'm obsessed with right now. I never thought I would be obsessed with. I'm going through the manual of insight, the progress of insight, a lot of, I appreciate um, even some of the things that Mahasi Saidao taught on the Satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness. And I, th I think that without that method and 
the way of teaching of Mahasi Sidao, we wouldn't have the modern secular mindfulness movement. And I, I think I want to put that on the board that Mahasi Sidao really, you know, pushed a way of, of this tradition of teaching mindfulness towards lay people. You know, the everyday people. So people like us, where, you know, the Thai Force tradition, of course, has uh, its teachings towards lay people and is a predominantly a monastic tradition. Right. right? And uh, so I, I do want to give a shout out to the, the, the Mahasi method because it's, it's something that everyday people like us can, can practice and can wake up to. Not just mindfulness as a stress reduction, like wake the fuck up and here is how. And, uh, and at the same time, yeah, the Thai forest tradition shout out to even like this playfulness, I think is, uh, kind of comes from our tradition of Ajahn Chah was, uh, uh, you know, a goofy guy, Ajahn Brahm, even today, Ajahn Brahm would be playing some Dharma death match right, right now. He jokes around. So I think that even the Thai forest tradition may be a little bit more playful too. Uh, yeah. You feel that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So who's your vote? Who wins? Ty Forrest. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> so it, it swept the board. Uh, see, I'm a big fan of the 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 side out tradition as well. Like I I love noting. You know, like I I, yep. I love that as a practice. I, I still use that as a practice. But it seems like my go to if I'm just gonna sit is just just to sit. You know, there's no no goal. There, I'm just like I'm not doing anything. I'm you know nowhere to go. No nothing to do. Yeah. It's right here. You know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweeping the board. <laughs> yeah. And just to be clear, I mean, we've started off our conversation talking a lot about, you know, we talked about retreat, but then we talked a lot about history and we talked a lot now about technique. You know, I, I think we can sometimes lose the essence of why most of us come to this path, which was said at the beginning, which is that, you know, we're looking for a pragmatic way to alleviate suffering. And suffering may be an intense word, even for some of us, but we're looking for a way to find peace. And the, the, the essence of the Buddhist teaching is that peace is available here and now, yeah. you know, and it's often actually the case that our thinking mind, you know, the getting so caught in the worry and the planning in the future and the past, you know, is really the reason why we suffer. And so in the beginning, if you're new to meditation or new to Buddhism, you came across this podcast. I think it's like sometimes we've got to remember that the importance is to slow down, you know, and to start looking at how much our thinking mind is. First, it's not personal. It's not our fault that the mind thinks, you know, but that we actually don't have to pay attention to it. You know, we don't have to get uh, caught in its running around and we can really train and we know this even the neuroscience perspective outside of the religious tradition you know we can really train ourselves to be more present and more aware of what's happening so that we don't get caught in the rabbit hole and we don't suffer you know um suffering happens but we can catch it you know and we can unhook from it you get that moment of uh, that that sacred pause to get in front of the suffering that's right And and we need not forget that because, you know, at the end of the day, I think what we're really talking about here is like finding peace in um, our everyday ordinary lives. It doesn't require a technique. It doesn't require knowledge of a history. You know, it doesn't require uh, knowledge of a certain sutta or Buddhist teaching. But I will say the reason why we get so pumped up and animated about it is because it has been so beneficial that we want more, you know, we want to know the history. We want to know the teachings. We want to honor the tradition. We want to learn about the techniques. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, 2,600 years is a pretty good efficacy rate. I'd say <laughs> for it to continue this long, you know, yeah. it's gotta, it's gotta be something to it. And it certainly had an impact on my life. You know, like I, I much like everyone else, I came to this, this path out of suffering. And uh, I think that's, you know, generally the case. 
Let me ask you a question, Justin. Sure. What do you remember? And I know I'm putting you on the spot, so take your time. But <laughs> when you first started practicing, like, and I know there are the stories and the things that we feel like we're supposed to say, but for you personally, what was it about meditation or the teachings or the teachers or whatever it was, but what was it that you found the most relief from or what, it, what resonated the most for you? What was it like in those early days that you started to connect with? It was uh, the, the first, how I, re- how I first got into the practice was just a simple mindfulness of breath. And it was just the, the ability to the, learning that I could break the addiction to the thinking mind. Mm-hmm. Now I was going through a pretty, uh, pretty hectic time in my life. At that point, I was incarcerated and, uh, my only escape was going inside, you know, so that, that, and that's what worked for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, that was my practice for quite a while. Like I, I was, I was a, you know, Buddhist quote unquote, you know, I wasn't really reading suttas or doing anything like that, but I was meditating daily and, and it was an escape vehicle for me at first. That's, that's what it was at first, but, and it did work for that, but that was what drew me to it was just that that I could turn the mind off, that I could have a bit of a reprieve from everything that was going on around me at the time. Yeah. And what a, what a powerful thing. It's subtle on paper. It's simple, but it's powerful. You know, and the Buddha says that in one of his teachings, the noble quest, he talks about the, the practice that he's teaching you know, really in some ways we could say meditation, you know, cause it's a big part of what he's teaching is subtle and it's not confined by thought. So that means it's experiential. It's something that you can experience. He, he goes on to say it's experienced by the wise and the wise are people that put it into practice. Right. So he's saying, this is something you can experience. And what you're saying is really powerful that underneath your stream of thoughts, there's the breath, that exists in the present also and that your attention is so caught in the stream of thoughts that you become identified with your thoughts as yourself. So not only do you have unpleasant thoughts that are wrecking your life right at that time, right? you also have this identification with your thoughts. You know, I'm a bad person because I think bad thoughts. I'm an angry person because I have angry thoughts. You know, but mindfulness teaches this really subtle but powerful practice that if you turn your attention to the breath, you get a reprieve, like you said, from that stream of endless wandering in our thoughts. You get a break from it. Right. And that you can actually put your attention on the breath, get that reprieve from those thoughts, and then you can start to see more clearly the thoughts and where they're leading you, how to unhook from them and how to turn towards these other parts of the practice, like how to turn, turn towards your life with compassion or with kindness, with forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah, So that's a, I mean, that's really why we teach, right? It's not Mm -hmm. the, you know, discourse on dependent origination, which is great. (laughs) You know, it's not this technique over that technique. It's that actually this is very attainable by all. Right. It's that, yeah, that the freedom is here and now. Right. That's right. Yeah, for sure. So if, if somebody was to come to wild heart, what, what could they expect? A good Sangha. Like that's something I have been looking for, for my whole life. I think is just a community to belong in. And I, I that's something I, uh, you know, almost pride myself in that, Wild Heart is a big ass community with, you know, Andrew calls it the the community of the brokenhearted. And I think when you live in a community of the brokenhearted, there's a, a lot of empathy, acceptance and and willingness to to live with these broken hearts. So just to even start with the, you know, what you're talking about, um, Buddha Dasa, I, I, I heard uh, I can't remember who it was. They were talking about 
how they're going all through Southeast Asia trying to find a community to practice with. This is back in the 70s. And they're going around uh, different um, you know, spiritual faith, whether Hindu or Jains or Buddhists, they're going around looking for a place to meditate and they'd go pl- practice with this community. And they like, oh, I don't know if they I really feel them. They go practice with another community and they go, oh, I don't know if I feel them. They go to Thailand to go to uh, Buddha Das's community. And as soon as they walk up to the gates of their monastery, somebody was there welcoming them. They said, I've been waiting for you. Thank you for coming to join us. And I, I, I think like that is the number one thing for me that I can find somebody there to welcome me and say, hey, I've been waiting for you. I, I don't even know who you are, but let's be friends and let's meditate together. And I think that's what Wild Heart is, is a group of friends with big ass broken hearts that are, are waiting for each other. And, more, you know, for years in my practice, I was sitting with only a couple people. I'd go to the Sangha, there'd be two people, four people. We, now we go to Wild Heart and it's like, yeah, 30 to 50 people in our, our, you know, just average sit, which is pretty cool for Dharma in the South. And then when we go there, a lot of it is, yeah, you know, Andrew is the guiding teacher, but he has a, um, I don't know, I, I don't know what his vision is, but it seems like it's a more a community run organization. He just heads the community run organization that we have multiple teachers involved with this community. And it's, it's fucking rad. Like these people are the people that I can trust. And then we, if you go to our, our sits, yeah, you sit for 30 minutes in a room full of people you can trust, you get a Dharma talk and a lot of discussion too. I like the idea. I think that maybe it's our connection with the recovery community that we welcome uh, people's voices into the room, even if they aren't experts at anything. Everybody's an expert of their own experience, right? So I think that's what's so rad about a lot of our community get togethers is we welcome in uh, discussion, right? Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, you know, Sangha community is the whole of practice. And I think that's what Wild Heart is. I, 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 I critique this that we call ourselves Wild Heart Meditation Center. Uh, yeah, we're, we meditate, but I think we are much more than just a meditation center. We're a big ass strong Sangha that has each other's backs as life has its inevitable sorrows. Yeah, for sure. That, that was the, that, that was the way it appeared to me. When mm-hmm. I, because I've only been there for a, a sit and a Dharma talk on the the one, well, a couple of times now. Uh, I was there uh, on one Sunday uh, during facilitator training, and then I was there uh, for Dave Smith when he came through on his way to a, a retreat, I believe. But yeah, just the the community there is amazing. Like you guys have got something really special there, and I, I tell people that all the time. I'm like, if you're ever in Nashville, like, and you're interested in this practice or meditation or anything or even along those lines, like go check out Wild Heart Meditation Center because you guys do really have something amazing going on there. And props to you guys for continuing to do that and continuing to put the effort forth to just keep that going because it's there's not even really a lot of meditation centers like that around. I don't in the country. I don't think at this point. Yeah, we got we got Sangha members that have Wild Heart tattoos. You know, that's fucking shout out if you're listening you're from wild heart i love you uh thank you yeah yeah you guys definitely got something pretty good going so what are you what are are your uh, plans for the future i know you've got this retreat coming up uh any other events you have planned um i mean i think like mikey said in general um you know him and i have been on a mission to teach together. It hasn't been an explicit mission on anything that we planned about or talked about ahead of time, but it's just kind of what we've fallen into is that uh, what Mikey said is true for me. I've always just been looking for community, you know, family. Um, And so I am trying to teach together. I'm trying to help train new facilitators and trying to just kind of help build the community. And um, so I can have a place that I belong, you know, and a place where I also am held not just as the teacher, but also the student and the friend, you know? And so I think for the future, you know, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. We want to teach a couple retreats a year 
We want to train the facilitators. We want to keep offering more intensive trainings and not just in facilitation, but also in a, a deeper dive into the Buddha's teachings. So courses that people can really take a teaching for eight weeks, for example, and study it and practice it. Um, so we've developed things like the Buddhist study series, which is kind of an introduction to our whole tradition and the Buddhist teachings and the living the Dharma program, which is more practice oriented. And then of course we have the facilitator training as well. And then we want to teach retreats and I mostly want to pass, pass the torch. That's kind of on the up and coming in the next few months is for me to step down as the guiding teacher to still be involved, but, um, I think any healthy community can't be centered around a personality. And it's one of the issues we see time and time again with uh, religious communities, you know, is um, I actually have drawn a lot from the, you know, nonprofit management structure and learning about, you know, what healthy nonprofit management is. It means that you have a board and rotating people and, you know, you, you basically build the raft, but you don't have to, ride it and command it the whole time, you know? And so I think I've built a decent enough raft with Hell the yeah. help of the song. <laughs> I think it's time for me to, you do know, uh, break, break. float along. Yeah. yeah. Do less. So. Yeah. Bef- before Andrew took over, we were in a, the, like a basement of a restaurant supply company. <laughs> and like when it rained, it would like rain into the meditation hall. And, uh, it, it was a mess. Uh, and now we have this like rad space that, you know, a lot of that just cause comes from Andrew. I know there was help from the community, but it's great to have like, yeah, gr- as gross as it sounds, the captain of the ship, you know, <laughs> and my fucking captain over here that guides us to, uh, you know, build this awesome Sangha. And now we have like a really nice place. And now it's built what I would like to see, you know, uh, a lot of influence from my uh, main teacher, the Venerable Paniwadi, that uh, Dharma off the cushion, right? That I something that lights me up in our facilitator training and in our teachings going to places like Mississippi to teach retreat. We are people in the Southeast. And uh, I think the Dharma in the Southeast are ready to uh, meet. And we have a special type of suffering in the South. And, and I, I think like if we just sit still in our cushions and look inward and find peace within our heart, that is great. But if, when we find that genuine peace in our heart, it, it doesn't know what to do besides explode out into the world, you know? So what I want to do is let our hearts grow and let that loving kindness radiate out into the world. And I want to see more service in this world, not service to just Buddhists, not service to this person or that person, not service to this political party or that political party. If anybody needs love, support, and help, I want this Dharma to be available to them. And that's my hopes for Wild Heart, that we can get outside of just the meditation halls and retreat centers and let that shit blow up, you know, radiate that loving kindness through action. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And and this has been actually a vision that we've talked about, you know, behind closed doors for a while. It's been intentional. Let me mm-hmm. say it that way. Yeah. You know, like my job was to build the infrastructure mm-hmm. and it's, I feel like it's built, you know, I feel like we have a good foundation now and, you know, I'm going to step down as the guiding teacher. I'm going to empower Mikey as the guiding teacher of wild heart and what he wants his vision to be. And we've talked about is outreach and service, you know, how we can give back to the community because any spiritual community, that's really what they're based around. That's why they exist. Right. You know, even from the atheistic perspective, which I'm fine taking on, which is like, what is just the utility of having religion? Right. It's community support, you know, and that's pragmatic. That's practical. That's needed. So even if none of this other shit exists, you know, we can be here in the here and now to be of support to our communities. And Mikey really wants to, you know, dedicate, you know, and our visions change over time. So we're going to give him the (laughs) opportunity (laughs) to change his, if he wants, (laughs) you know, but at where it stands right now, that's kind of where he wants to take the torch. And I want to support him with that and making sure that we're getting out in the world and and making a difference. 
For sure. For sure. Yeah. I know a lot of people that are really focused on the outreach right now. And, and that's kind of like my take with it as well is like really that boots on the ground Dharma, like how can I help? You know, that, that's my big thing. And I try to try to be of service as much as possible uh, for sure. Much to my own chagrin sometimes. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Anyway, well, uh, so where can people, I mean, obviously uh, they can find you at Wild Heart Meditation Center in Nashville. Uh, that's on Gallatin Pike, correct? That's right. 3123 Gallatin Pike. And you can find our website, wildheartmeditationcenter.org. All of our classes, all of our information. If you want to join our email list, it's all on there. We're on all the socials. We also have a podcast for listeners. If people yeah. want to listen to some of our teaching, you know, before they check out a retreat or if they're just interested, it's just called Wild Heart Meditation Center. And you can find that on uh, iTunes or Spotify most places where you get podcasts. So um, they can check it. Uh, highly recommend, highly recommend that podcast. If you're interested in the Dharma at all, highly recommend that podcast. It's like being up front at Wild Heart Meditation Center. <laughs> That's right. It's recorded live from our classes. So you can kind of get a sense of what a, a group feels like. Absolutely. Well, hey, thank you guys for taking the time. I love y'all. Thank you so much for what you do and what you're doing for the world. And just, man, you guys are killing it. I really appreciate you guys. Thanks. Yeah, man. Yeah, we appreciate you. One more, Justin. one more, because you know I have to do this. That we do have, like, I just want to announce that straight up that September first through the fifth, uh, that we have our five day peace within the wild heart silent retreat, and you can get all the information about that. It's floweringlotusmeditation.org. Floweringlotusmeditation. Dot org. If you go there, you can sign up for this retreat, learn about this retreat, any contacts, if you have any questions, the emails, the phone numbers are available there. Be Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. So uh, please come, come. if anything, you, you got anything out of our the conversation today, come see it in person. Come out to Mississippi. Come sit at a meditation retreat with us. Come be part of the family. Come be part of the Sangha. Uh, floweringlotusmeditation.org. Yeah, come sit with us, y'all. Big thanks again to Mikey and Andrew for taking the time to be on the show. And if you're interested in anything Wild Heart Meditation Center has going on, they can be found at wildheartmeditationcenter.org. And if you're interested in the residential retreat coming up in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, there's a few spots left, so be sure to go check it out at floweringlotusmeditation.org. Thanks again for listening. Namaste.